this meetup. Obviously, it's our, it's our first ever virtual one. Um, and we're running tonight in partnership with OVO, um, OVO Energy. Uh, so first, I, I just want to thank the guys there uh, for working with us on this. Um, a particular mention goes out to Darcy, uh, who's worked really hard with me to get this, this meetup um, sorted. And um, so obviously with that in mind, we, we have uh, Dave Cooper and Kieran Allen as our first two speakers. They're both software engineers um, at OVO. Um, and then our third speaker is uh, someone I know uh, well called Costas. Um, who, who is a senior software engineer uh, at the moment working as a contractor in the telecoms uh, industry. Um, so I'm going to pass you over to Dave in a minute. I just want to say that if, um, if you are doing anything on social media tonight whilst watching the event, please remember to hashtag JS Roundabout. Um, we're looking to obviously expand the meetup, get more followers, um, more great content for you guys. So Twitter, Instagram, whatever you're on, just hashtag JS Roundabout. Um, obviously, at the end, I'll tell you about uh, the other meetups we do and what we've got coming up for you. But for now, um, I'm going to pass you all over to Dave, um, our first speaker from OVO. He's going to begin now. Thanks very much. Hello, everyone. This is really cool doing an online meetup. Um, I don't think that I've done an online meetup before, so it's actually making me feel a little bit more nervous than doing something in person. Uh, but let's get stuck into it. I'll just share my screen so we can, we can see some slides uh, and just minimize that. Um, so yeah, uh, this, is, this is my presentation uh, called Build the Thing, which is super vague, but we're going to build some things and hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll learn some stuff along the way. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm Dave. Uh, I'm, I'm a front-end engineer at OVO Energy, living in the absolute middle of nowhere at the moment uh, with my in-laws and partner, uh, which is really, really nice to avoid things like global pandemic diseases. Uh, and if you ever want to get hold of me, um, you can hit me up on Twitter or email um, or whatever. I'm always available for a chat about anything. Um, but yeah, we're also hiring. Um, it's a really great place to work. Uh, if you if you're sort of interested in you know green energy or really cool tech or both, um, just give me a shout and I'll hook you up. Um, so anyway, let let's do some things. So I'm I'm going to start off telling a really quick story. Hopefully, it'll only take about five minutes or, or so. Uh, and if you're still here, we'll uh, we'll write some code and build some things, uh, and hopefully, uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll have some fun there. So you're probably going to learn uh, in about 30 seconds that I'm not a very good story writer. Uh, so I'm just going to um, hopefully go through this as fast as I can. Um, but anyway, here, here's a story. Um, once upon a time in the middle of nowhere, um, which is where we're staying, uh, my father-in-law decided that he'd build this uh, really large, really amazing natural swimming pond out in, out in their field. And it's really cool. Like it's sort of one of those things where the plant life in, in the water helps you know, pull all, the, pull all the nutrients out of the water and the sunlight hits the water and creates more food for the plants. And there's some air pumping around for water circulation uh, and also to oxygenate the water. And there's no chemicals or, or filters or anything like that. It sort of just sustains life quite nicely. Uh, and it was really cool. It's really nice to swim in. It's got a, a shallow area and a deep area. Uh, and yeah, something was a little bit up because... I sort of watched my, my father-in-law build this with his, with his bare hands. You know, he shoveled about 20, 20 tons or something of gravel and, and worked it all out how to build this thing. Uh, and I hadn't really contributed much to it other than the odd bit here and there. And I sort of wanted to, to leave my mark on it. And so I had a bit of a think about this. And one day while we were swimming in there, um, my partner for about the millionth time claimed that the, the pond was as warm as a bath, um, which really winds me up because nothing is as warm as a bath in this country except for a warm bath. Uh, so, but it sort of triggered something in, in my mind. And, and I thought, you know what? Um, I could probably build something that we can throw into the pond that'll let us know what the temperature is uh, all the time, uh, which would be really cool. Um, so I sort of thought about how I'd go about doing that. Uh, and I gathered some things that I wanted. Uh, I knew I'd need something like a Raspberry Pi uh, and 
you know, some temperature sensors and stuff to hook it all up and stuff to weatherproof it. And I needed like a 4G modem for it because it was out of Wi-Fi um, reception. And I sort of looked at a load of YouTube tutorials and I could give a talk on just building this alone, but that's not what this talk is about. Um, I, I sort of mashed it all together and this is kind of what I got. Um, it's sort of been a bit updated since then. I've, I've soldered all of the um, all of the components onto an actual uh, PCB. So uh, things don't come apart uh, as easily as they do as, as the setup in that picture, but it's pretty good and it works. I'm really happy with it. Um, so I built that thing and then I needed to build another thing where I could actually visualize uh, all of the temperature data um, that I was uh, that I was pulling in from these from these temperature sensors. And hilariously enough, pondtemperature.com was available. Um, so, you know, this is pondtemperature.com. Uh, I still find it hilarious that I was able to get that domain. And you can see it's pretty simple. It do, don't look at this on mobile or tablet because it looks like absolute garbage. I haven't been bothered to um to to write the mobile or tablet starlings for this yet, mostly because. Um, having a baby takes up a lot of your time. Um, but, you know, this works and I'm really happy with it all. Uh, and yeah, that, that works really nicely. And that's sort of the segue that I want to use into building things. Um, that was one thing that I was able to work out how to build just through YouTube tutorials and asking friends really silly questions. Um, but it leads me nicely into static site generators. Uh, you know, there's a bit flavor of the month, but they have been around for a long time. Uh, they're very cool. So some of you all have heard of them and some of you uh, might not have heard of them or not quite know, not know what they are. Um, so breaking it down, you know, HTML, JavaScript, CSS comprises the static site part of the term. Uh, and a generator is a thing that creates a thing. So obviously when you combine those terms together, you've got a thing that creates static sites, um, which is probably trivializing it a little bit. Um, the tooling behind these static site generators does a lot more than that. So it'll do, a lot of them handle things these days like deployments and adding an API layer, adding routing into your application and loads more stuff. Um, so it's a little bit richer than that. And there is a million of them, millions of static site generators out there. Uh, and they're all pretty awesome. Tonight, we're gonna to talk about Next.js, uh, which you know a lot of you have probably heard of or used um, or even more familiar with than I am. I'm not, I'm not a super expert on, on these things. Um, but the main thing to take away from this is that you can apply a lot of the principles that we're talking about at the moment to other, other static site generators. Uh, so, you know, we've got Next, which is a static site generator, which will spit out a React application for you. But other static site generators might spit out things like Vue or Angular or vanilla JavaScript um, sites. It really just depends. Uh, and then we've got, you know, the company behind uh, Next uh, called Vercel. They used to be called Now. Uh, the other really big thing that they've done is uh, creating a React data fetching hook called SWR, which we'll also look at tonight. Uh, and they've, they have done a lot of other um, open source stuff and the community is really, really great. So definitely go check them out if you're not too familiar with them already. Um, so anyway, things that Next can do out of the box. Uh, starting from the top, you know, it gives you TypeScript support out of the box, which is fantastic. You know, we love TypeScript. Uh, it handles routing for you. It uses React Router under the hood and it sort of handles that layer uh, really nicely for you. It'll add an API layer into your application for you for free if you want it. Uh, mechanisms for getting static and dyna dynamic data into your application, a really good local development uh, setup. And then you get some bells and whistles as well. So you get things like performance monitoring uh, metrics straight out of the box. So you, it, it gives you a really easy way of feeding uh, that sort of data like page load times and, and error rates and all of that into third-party applications, or you might want to process it yourself. Uh, and then other things, you know, it's got really cool stuff built into it where it allows you to have a, a web application that has client-side and server-side rendering out the box without having to configure anything. So that's really cool. Uh, and as I mentioned on the slide here as well, again, the, the documentation and online community are really fantastic uh, from my experience. But we've sort of been talking about these things, uh, and I think it's time to build some things. So. What we're going to do, and I know there was an NPM outage earlier today, so I'm really hoping that we're, we're good at the moment. Um, but I'm going to assume that you've got NPM or Yarn installed. Uh, and uh, so if we call uh, npx create next app, and we'll call it in this directory, um, create next app. Oh, excellent. Uh, this, is, this is lovely that we're getting some nice, uh, nice <laughs> NPM errors. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, 
Uh, let's do that. That's probably a little bit of nerves. I had a spelling mistake. Cool. That should probably work now. Yeah. So Create Next App is a, uh, a scaffolding tool, uh, like a bootstrapping tool, similar to Create React App uh, and similar to you know the Angular CLI and all of the equivalents and, and all of your, your frameworks and all of that. And that's just going to create us uh, a really nice base application uh, that we can use. You'll see it gives us three scripts. So we've got dev, build, and start, uh, which is pretty common. So if we run uh, the dev command, that'll spin up a, um, a local dev server on port 3000. If we wait for that, uh, I'm sure that my computer is struggling a little bit at the moment because it's screen sharing and, and all of that at the same time. Webpack is not always the fastest. Um, but we've got sort of like a, a standard boilerplate application here. You know, welcome to Next.js. And it's got some stuff that lead, leads up to the documentation. So let's take this thing. Um, and we're in our pages directory here in the, in the root of that, which is where um, our, our pages are stored. Um, let's just strip out most of this stuff. So let's get rid of this. And let's get rid of this. And now we're just left with uh, a div that has some container styles. And you'll notice that we're importing from a style sheet. So we already know that we get uh, CSS modules out of the box for um, for free. So let's just you know create put a header in here called my things, and we can see that you know that we now have my things. Uh, and just really quickly, what we'll do, I don't need that. Let's just create a new file in here as well um, to just see what other cool stuff we've got. Um, if we create a file called otherthings.js, and we'll import a default function, and we'll return one saying other things. Uh, if we save that and go back into our browser, and if we now go to localhost slash other things, we, we've now got the routing for straight out of the box, didn't need to do much other than create the file. And based on this um, directory and file structure, that's how we can do the, the, the paths to different pages in our, in our application. So that's just one cool thing that I thought I'd show, um, but we probably won't touch on that for the rest of this demo. Um, but what we're going to do now is we're going to kill our dev server and we're going to, we, so we're done writing JavaScript. We now want to write TypeScript. So we'll switch this file name to .ts, which is, you know, what we sort of want to do. And we'll spin up the dev server again and see what happens. Now this time we are expecting uh, some sort of error. Yep, because you know, next is nice. And it says, it looks like you're trying to use TypeScript, but you don't have the right things installed. So let's, Let's install those things. So, you know, we want TypeScript itself and the typings for React and Node. So we can do that. Hit enter, and that should only take a sec. And now, if I run the dev server again, hopefully, you know, we've detected TypeScript in your project and created a TS config for you. That's pretty cool of you next to do that for us. Uh, and it looks like that that's compiled successfully. So if we go back to our, uh, our home page. Oh, cool. Getting all sorts of errors today. Let's uh, let's try and spin up the dev server again. I'm going to blame this on the uh, the npx. Oof, this is this is lovely to go in a. What is go oh? I'm an idiot. I'm sure you're all thinking, Dave, you're an idiot. Uh, don't know what's going wrong with me today. It's a TSX file. Lovely. Cool. So we've got, sorry about that. Um, I have run through this a million times as well. This is very silly of me. Um, anyway, so we've now got TypeScript out of the box, which is really cool. And we didn't really have to do anything other than install TypeScript. Um, so let's just make start to make this a little bit more uh, complex. Actually, let's make this a div. Uh, and we'll add a random thing. Uh, and let's just, um, let's add a random number in here. So math.random. Uh, times 100, that's one. So we're generating a random number between one and 100. And, and now you can see when we reload the page, we're getting a new random number. Um, and then extending from this, let's just say that we wanted to get a random number between one and 100, but we wanted to fetch that server side before feeding it into our, into our component. You know, a more real world example would be fetching a user and then passing the user details into the component from, from the server before rendering. Um, but we'll just keep it simple. So next actually gives us this uh, ability. Uh, so let's say get server-side props. And I think there's TypeScript typings for that. 
that's an async function. And if we return a props object in here, of course, random thing, uh, and we can take this, this, uh, and then I think we should just be able to pass it into home. So let's we'll call this random thing. We we'll even type this since we've got TypeScript equals random thing, and that's a number. Um, and then let's just render that there. And now if we save this, oh, we need to export this as well. Um, so now when we go back into our page, we're still getting the same result, but this is actually, this random thing is now coming from the server. And that's quite handy. As I said, you know, for doing things like loading up user data um, and, and, and loads of other stuff. But uh, this is the really cool part though, is that let's just say instead of just this page needing this bit of functionality, let's say that multiple pages need it. And we want to make it an API endpoint instead and call into that. So what I'll do is I'll delete all of this because we don't need it. Uh, and we'll get rid of our, all of our props being passed through. We'll get rid of all of this. And what next does is in the API directory, which is a special directory, um, we can actually create a file uh, in here. Uh, we'll call it random thing. And if we export a default function from it, uh, the function will take a request object, which will be a next API request, and a response object, which is a next API response. Um, if we return, uh, actually, we don't need to do that. We could say um, the response.status is 200. So you can return a JSON object. And you can see that we're importing um, those, those types up there. Sorry about that. Um, let's do that same logic again, where we've got random thing. Times 100, one. So now, believe it or not, we actually now have an, an API endpoint that we can consume. Uh, and let's have a look at how we might do that. Oh, that's, gee, I'm full of mistakes today. <laughs> I, I do bear with me. Um, okay, so we, we've got this API endpoint that we want to consume from. So this would be a good point to introduce um, a hook uh, called SWR, which say, stands for stale while revalidate. And basically what this hook does, it's got some interesting behavior. Um, in, uh, or use SWR from SWR. This hook uh, allows us to call, you know, whatever endpoint we, we want to, and it will always be revalidating data, but displaying the stale data while it's re revalidating. So, and it will update the, the UI once it gets anything new through. So it sort of lends itself quite well to reactive architecture. Um, but it's probably easier to just see the thing in action. So let's make this a component now. Let's make this a random thing. A random thing. Uh, and let's, uh, let's call out to our endpoint. So I'll write out this line and then I'll explain what's going on. Equals use SWR slash API slash uh, random thing. Uh, we'll pass it a fetch a function, which we'll write in a second. I'll explain that. And we've got, we've got a little bit of uh, config to give to it. Uh, revalidate on focus, false. Uh, okay, so let's talk, let's talk about this line here. Uh, we can even tell it what we're, gonna, we're expecting back. So let's just do that now as well. Um, so what we're saying is we're using our hook. Uh, and we're giving it a type hint, whoops, uh, saying that we're going to get back a random thing, which is a number. And then we're passing through the, uh, the, the endpoint that we want to call, which is also the key that uh, the hook caches on. Um, and then we've got this fetcher function. All a fetcher function is in the context of SWR uh, is a function that goes and is responsible for getting your data. So we'll use a really basic one. Um, so we'll say fetcher um, is a function and it'll take a URL, which is a string uh, and it'll fetch that URL and then we'll take the response and we'll convert it to JSON. Um, and that's all our fetcher function is. Obviously, you know, you, in a real world, you know, you might be adding you know, request headers and stuff like that. You, or you might be using an API service to make that call, but we're just going to keep it basic. Um, and then this revalidate on focus, basically anytime uh, the window gets focus or the, 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 the component gets focus that we're talking about, 
Uh, SWR by default will try and revalidate that data by calling out to the endpoint and updating the UI if it needs to. And because we know this uh, endpoint is returning random data, we don't really want that to happen otherwise it's always gonna be displaying new data. Um, but anyway, and then we have the data object itself that comes back. So what we can say is if there's no data, let's uh, return uh, a div, let's say loading. Uh, and then if we have our data, um, by this point, we can just say random thing data dot, and because we gave it that type hint uh, when we called the hook, we've got autocomplete on that. And now we've actually got an endpoint that we can call. So if we spin up the, um, or that, sorry, that's we are now calling that endpoint. So now if we, we come back in here, we can see once again, it's the same functionality, but if I pop open uh, our network tab, and reload, you'll see that we've actually called an endpoint. And we've got that for free and that's really, really cool. Um, so that was pretty quick to build up something that you know fetches stuff from a back end and displays it on a front end. Um, and that was really cool. Uh, but I uh, won't go back to full screen here. We need to get this on the internet because um, it's not very fun if, we, if we're not sharing it with all of our friends. So what we're gonna do is we'll kill the dev server and Built the thing, and we'll push that upstream. So we we'll hit my GitHub repository, uh, and then I'm logged into Vercel's, uh, you know, interface online. So Vercel.com. I created an account, integrated it with my GitHub account. That takes five seconds. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty easy to do. But we'll hit import project. And hopefully this loads. Let's try another tab. It apparently works in another tab. Um, so we'll go to github.com slash krug slash, uh, what do I call this build the thing. I'll make this repository public as well, if it's not already, um, so that you can all sort of have a look at this. But anyway, Vercel's already worked out that we've got a next application um, and there's a load of presets, but loads and loads of things. Um, so feel free to have a look at, uh, look at that. Uh, and we'll leave all of the defaults. You know, we don't want to inject any environment variables. Um, okay, thanks for sell. Have we actually pushed that upstream to master? Build the thing, let's try it one more time. Okay, um, one. Don't do me like this, the cell. <laughs> I'm not really getting much luck here. Um, Let's let's try that again. Um, GitHub.com slash grog slash build the thing. All right, let's try that. Please work. <laughs> this is so silly. <laughs> cool. Okay, so this is that. Yeah, you shouldn't really run into those problems. I don't know what's going on now. I do blame the npm outage from earlier today. It's probably caused some problems in a lot of places. But anyway, so Vercel's building my project for me. Uh, and you know, this looks pretty similar to standard build output. Um, and hopefully uh, it will create and upload my project for me. Cool, so congrats, your project's been deployed. Really nice confetti, uh, lovely. And what we can do is we can visit that and you'll see that if you now go to, and you can do this in your browser as well, if you go to build the thing app, you'll actually see that my thing's there. You know, that that didn't take too long. And you know, if we go into the, the, the network tab, you can see that that actually is calling out to my API that I've written. Um, and you know, we got that all that for free and didn't have to worry about you know creating the infrastructure behind that. Um, and then lastly, in terms of building these cool things, I just want to show you one last thing. If we create a new branch, uh, build another thing, and let's build another thing real quickly. So uh, let's call this another thing. And we go another thing. Let's just return, I don't know, a H1, my name is Dave. Save that. And because we're naughty, we're not going to test that locally. We'll just assume that works. Built another thing. We'll push that upstream. 
Cool. And if we go into GitHub and we create a pull request for this, you'll see that the cell's already got some hooks into our, into our PR stuff. You can see it's, the bot has already added a comment into this, being like, you know, you can go and inspect the build for this. That's quite nice. You'll be very familiar with this for things, you know, with your, your CI CD pipelines. Uh, and you'll see that that's running the same build that it did before. It's doing all the things it needs to do and uploading it. And then hopefully in just a second, I don't need to keep stalling for time. Build complete. And if we come in here uh, any second now, this should probably update. And you'll see that it's updated. And we now have a link that's straight out to uh, a build environment for this branch um, with my changes, but it's it's not on the it's not on master yet. But this makes it really handy for when you're you know you're you're viewing people's PRs and you don't need to spin up your own um, your own environment. You know you don't need to spin up locally and test it. You can actually see it running in your browser straight away. Uh, and Kieran's actually going to be talking to you about some similar ish stuff that you can achieve with with uh, GitHub Actions in a little bit. Um, so that should be a, that's a, a nice little segue there. Um, but that's all I wanted to show you from, the, I guess, the next side of things. Um, and which, you know, I, I think it's pretty cool to see, you know, we haven't even been doing this for half an hour and we've got, you know, a TypeScript application that uses CSS modules that calls an API endpoint. Uh, it's, it has automatic build pipelines. It has per branch environments. It deploys to the internet. It gives you nice URLs. If you wanted to use a custom URL as well, uh, Vassell lets you do that really easy as well. You know, it's doing all of these things and we didn't need to worry about like all of the, the, the DevOps, the infrastructure side of things. We didn't have to waste time setting it up and swearing too much at our computers because nothing's working and all of that. And I guess the point that I want to make about all of this is that if you've, if you've got a project that you know you want you really want to build, but you've been procrastinating about you know whether it's a blog site or it's something like what I've done, where I just want to display some data for a, a personal house project that I've been working on or anything like that. Um, just just build it and and you leverage the tooling that is available by these things to 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 get this thing on the internet. Show your friends, show your family, show hacking news, show show strangers on the internet. Um, I just really want to. I, I hope that some people. We'll, we'll see things, presentations like this and be inspired to, to go and actually do those things. And, and yeah, that's, that's basically what I want to talk to you about. Um, the, the code for tonight's up on that repository and there's some links to, to Next.js and Vercel. Definitely go check it out. Um, as I said at the beginning of the talk, if you ever want to talk to me about these sorts of things, I'm, I'm always, up for, always up for a chat about that stuff. Um, so yeah, that's basically it. Um, I really appreciate you know having having your time and uh, thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much, Dave. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, great talk. Um, thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, the comments are coming through, so it's definitely appreciated um, for everyone. Um, we'll um, okay. So. Kieran, we, we can we can get started with Kieran, uh, also a software engineer at Ovo. Um, so take it away. Yeah, thank you very much. So today I am here to talk to you about GitHub Actions, um, specifically just an introduction to GitHub Actions. Maybe if you're not. Um, familiar with it before, it's. Um, I hope you come away from this talk with an idea of what's possible with GitHub Actions, um, especially if you're hosting your code on GitHub. I think it makes a lot of sense to, as Dave said in his previous talk, you know, leverage the tools that are there to get stuff done um, quicker. So, um, a bit about myself. Um, I am a front end dev at Ovo, been here now for about two and a half years. Um, really enjoy the work I'm doing there. Worked on a bunch of very interesting projects. And uh, yeah, mainly React, React Native, things like that. And before that, I was at a company called Playtech BGT Sports. And uh, yeah, really enjoying the front end world so far. Um, so 
Uh, what am I actually going to be doing on this talk? Um, there's going to be very few slides. It's primarily going to be live coding. So what are we going to be doing? Um, I'm going to be setting up a very simple workflow that will, we're going to unit test our code. Um, we are going to build a PR specific environment. Um, we'll be creating an S3 bucket that will host our PR code on that. And then we'll also be leveraging um, community GitHub actions to then comment the URL of that S3 bucket on our PR. Um, this is something we've done, or I guess this is something I've implemented on projects that I have worked at on OVO. And I find it's very useful, especially like if you want to share designs or something with your UX designer or your product manager or things like that. It's very useful because they don't have to then check out the code. You just point them to a PR and there's a link there already. They can check it out. They'll see exactly what's changed versus let's say your test and your UAT test environment or something like that. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I, I think it's probably best just to jump right in. Cool. So to get started, um, I've just set up a very simple create react app. Um, and to get started with GitHub Actions within your repository, it's as simple as just having a .github directory. And inside that, then we're going to have our workflows file. So I've created one already. It's just PR open update. And just some comments that I'm going to use later out of fear of just completely messing up URLs. So we're going to start off with a name. And we're just going to call it what the file's named. But you can call this whatever you want. And next, we're going to want to define when our um, when a workflow is going to run. So we're going to say that this is going to run on pull requests. And what's quite cool about GitHub Actions is that you can leverage um, events within like pull requests. So for example, here we're going to run pull requests when they are opened for the first time. We're going to run it when they are synchronized or when they're updated and we're going to run when they are reopened. So let's say we close it, we tear down an environment, but we decide later to reopen it, then we're going to run it here as well. Um, so yeah, you can really kind of, I guess, tweak exactly when you want to run these pipelines and things like that. So first we're going to define our first job. Um, workflows are defined, are consist of jobs. Um, you can have multiple jobs. You can set them up to be dependent on one another. So let's say you have a, um, a Terraform build or something like that. Uh, you have unit tests first. So you only want to run Terraform if your unit test pass or something like that. Um, yeah, you can set jobs up to be dependent. So we're just going to create our first one now. PR open updates. And now we're going to set up just some environmental variables that we need for our AWS CLI later on. AWS access PID. And here we're going to be using the secrets. Dot access key ID. And we'll also be grabbing our secret key. Secret access key. Let's secret underscore access. And just to let you know exactly where these are. So if we go to our repository and then we go into settings um, to add secrets, it's really just a simple settings and we have our secrets defined in here then. Um, once you have them defined in here, we have access to them within our workflow and you can just work away with them as you need. So uh, we're also just going to define our default region for data with CLI later. And finally, we just need to use our GitHub token because one of the community actions that we'll be leveraging later will require this. Cool. So the name of our first job, we've set up some environmental variables. So what we want to do now is define 
what machine this runs on. Um, with GitHub Actions, you can run it on a bunch of different Linux distros. You have Mac OS. I believe you can run it on some Windows machines, if you so wish. Um, but for this one, we're just going to throw it onto Ubuntu latest. And then inside this, we have our steps where the automation takes place. Um, so first off, we are going to check out our code. And to do this, we're going to be using one of the predefined actions that um, GitHub supplies us. So actions slash checkout at v2. And the cool thing about GitHub actions is that you can take this and if you go to github.com slash action actions slash checkout. That'll lead directly to a GitHub repository where all this code is defined. And the at v2 specifies our points to a release. So if we want to be more specific, we could say at version 2.3.1. Um, we're just going to leave that at version 2 and just grab the latest version of that. So we've checked out the code. And now we are just going to install Node. And again, um, it's really as easy as using just another predefined action. Less writing for us and keeps the workflows a bit cleaner, I think. So we're just going to call this action and then we're going to define what version we're going to run. So we're just going to use the long term support at the moment, which is 12. So we've installed Node. Now we're going to run and we're going to do an npm install. Hopefully, npm still works by the time this needs to be done. Um, we're going to run an npm test unit test passes, and we are going to do an NPM build. Um, under normal circumstances, I guess your NPM test would be a separate job, where this job then depends on your tests and linting passing. But um, OK, so we've generated some build files. Now what we need to do is install our AWS CLI. So AWS CLI. And once again, there is an action for that. Um, the community actions in GitHub Actions, I think, are probably the best thing about it. Um, this means you don't have to write a lot of code yourself. Action dash AWS dash CLI version point one. So yeah, this is going to do all the work for us. Um, it'll install AWS CLI on this Ubuntu latest. And now we are ready to actually create that S3 bucket that we're going to host our PR environment on. So now we're going to use if statements. So we only want to create this S3 bucket when we open our PR for the first time, in which case the, button, the bucket doesn't exist, or we reopen a closed um, PR, in which case we've torn down that bucket after a closure. So here we can say if github event.action is equal to opened or if github event.action is equal to reopened we're going to run the following code uh, so i'm going to give it a name obviously the name field here is completely optional i'm just showing it in to make it i think easier to read and work with so create an s3 bucket and we're going to run some commands here, so multi-line comments. And I'm just going to cheat a wee bit and copy this stuff. It's quite AWS specific, so it's not really anything in particular to do with GitHub Actions. Um, the only thing I would mention here is that we also have access to our pull request number. So if you have multiple PRs going in a repository, which I'm sure you do, um, it just stops name clashes and things like that. So it's like you're always left with a unique bucket, basically. Um, so we've created our bucket. We're going to uh, make it into a website bucket so we can access it off the internet. And now what we want to do is copy our files over to that bucket. I'm just going to jump up here. 
copy this bit of code. So yeah, copying all our build files over to the bucket that we've created above here as part of our opened um, and just set up to public read so we can actually access it. Okay, so let's recap now. We've installed Node, or we've checked out the code, installed Node, um, installed our AWS CLI. We've created a bucket, bucket when we opened this PR for the first time. We've copied our files to S3, and now what we want to do is comment on our PR. So, events.action. We're just going to say we only want to run this uh, if my E key works. Only not opened. So, name, comment S3 URL on Pierre. We're going to tap into another great uh, community action. So unsplash on here. And here we're going to reference a branch as opposed to a release, which you can do if you want. Um, generally, it's better to point to an actual release. But if you want, you can point to a branch. And I believe you can even point to a checksum if you so wish. And we have with, and we're just going to provide the message that will send back our post on our PR. Cool. So this is what's going to show up when this is sent to S3. Cool. So fingers crossed there's no um, syntax errors. So we're going to. Commit this to our repository. Push that up. Awesome stuff. So we've added that workflow to our repository now. What we need to do is we're going to create a new branch. Um, oh. And let's just make a tiny little change. Enter the fun zone. And we're just going to push this up and we'll make a PR in a minute. Push, yes. Sure. So if we go back to our repository, this will be all good. We're just going to create this awesome stuff. And we should see here in a moment that. Um, that our GitHub action should start working. Awesome. So if you go over to details, we'll see this working. Uh, starting up your workflow. And just to keep an example of what it'll be like when it's done, go over to update. So basically, it should be something like this, where again, we've changed a cool to fun. And if we go to this website, we should see that this is updated and this is like PR specific. So you can point someone who doesn't want to run your code at this and they should be able to check out the changes. So we're just going to let this run now. And hopefully it doesn't take too terribly long. Yeah, this, this stuff is actually surprisingly similar, I think, to what Dave covered. Um, just having those like PR specific environments and things like that. Um, obviously, you do need to set up your own um, infrastructure and stuff in this case. So it's not quite out of the box. But um, yeah, I think it's, I mean, we've set up now all this stuff in less than 20 minutes. So it shows kind of how easy it is to get set up and um, think how functional it is. So just install the AWS CLI. Creating that S3 bucket, sweet. Copying files over, commenting on our PR. Awesome. So 
looks like it all went out off with a hitch. Go over to our PR now. We'll see that this number is bumped up to 16. You can go to it. Awesome. Let's change the fun. Uh, very cool. So um, that was cool. But what should I look into next? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm hoping this talk, it's very much aimed towards beginners, but I'm hoping it did kind of like whet your appetite as to what's possible with GitHub Actions. Um, what I'd recommend doing is taking a look at more community-defined actions. There really is an absolute massive list of, um, of actions available, um, everything from Terraform to posting messages to Slack or Telegram or a bunch of different... Um, messaging apps, there's probably an action that already exists for it. Um, if you want to go a bit deeper, I'd recommend looking and trying to build your own reusable actions. That's always a fun little exercise to do. Um, there's also a bunch of interesting stuff around running multiple different versions of the operating system, or let's say you want to run your code on multiple different versions of Node. You can look into running these pipelines kind of on a matrix where you define what versions or what operating systems you want to run on, and your um, the build pipeline then will automatically do that. Uh, we can also run GitHub Actions on a schedule, so we can show our end-to-end -end tests in there. Let's say we're running some Cypress end-to-end -end tests, we can have those running on a schedule. If something was to go wrong, we could, let's say, automatically then create an issue within GitHub. We could maybe tag a member of the team who would then get notified automatically. So there's a lot you can do. And um, obviously, yeah, if you're interested, just give it a go in some personal projects and uh, hopefully you enjoy it as much as I do. And if there's any questions, please do ask. Uh, also, if you want to check out the code, please do go for it. Um, but yeah, that, that's it really, unless there's anything else. Another great talk. Thanks a lot, Kieran. Um, really appreciate it. And um, yeah, as Kieran said, any questions, um, guys, put it put it in the in the chat. But otherwise, um, we'll we'll move on. Um, so Costas, our first our first talker speaker tonight, who's not at OVO. So Costas, senior JavaScript engineer currently contracting in the telecommunications industry. Um, I'll pass over to you, Costas, when you're ready. Uh, thanks, Ben. Uh, really nice talks, actually, and um, really interesting parts to start exploring pretty soon. Um, so yeah, I'm Costas. Uh, I've been working, uh, initially, I started doing the research for like around multimedia technology and um, uh, mostly web related and video streaming, real time communication and 3D animations. Um, later on, I started moving to more towards uh, web um, uh, SDK side for the browsers and getting a little bit more expertise on um, how the browsers work with JavaScript uh, and Node.js. Um, besides of that, uh, a little bit, uh, I've been working with automation uh, continuous delivery and managing teams uh, on how the workflow and yeah, how we build team uh, things and how we arrange uh, the workflow in a smooth way. Um, and this time, uh, the presentation will be mostly about some kind of decision making about frameworks, about how we how we use those tools, and how I saw over time um, some pain points and what uh, can be a little bit um, difficult to manage. Um, so, yeah, let me share the screen. Um, here we are. Uh, so, yeah, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, it will be mostly about decisions we make when we start a new project or when we want to migrate or we want to refactor. And um, maybe sometimes you take a decision to onboard new people in that team and you want to get a fresh, uh, fresh start. Uh, of the product, uh, but also it helps a lot when you when you start a new uh, from scratch. Uh, one of the main uh, problems 
or the main the, the first questions to ask is what you're gonna uh, build and and also how that is going to be deployed distributed um and there are there are a few things that you will be doing over and over again um not only in one project but even if it's um in different um, frameworks in different like even if it's uh, from vanilla javascript you need to take care of a few bits and pieces uh, over and over again uh, the one would be the, like if you create a rest api if you create uh, what what's going to be the project's uh, file structure uh, taking care of caching um, the assets you're going to use if it's the client side application um, that you want to bundle it how you set up your debugging environment styles and css in that like how they how they're going to be mixed and matched um, and you want to keep uh, everything consistent in a way uh, even if you believe one project can be part actually one product will be many projects from git uh, coming together so you should try to get as much consistency as possible even though that can that could come from different teams sometimes still it's good to have some sort of a common way of thinking um, and that will help the collaboration and also like between teams communication um, one of the uh, one of the first questions would be how uh, you pick what tool you're going to use and frameworks and initially what comes to mind usually would be the popularity but we have seen that changing over like within a few years or a few months you can see some coming up and some others vanishing or or changing a lot uh, like uh, with massive breaking changes um, but it's like jumping to the next version would be a whole new uh, pile of work um, so uh, also we see the support communities around these um, like if they're quite popular usually they have a lot of support the documentation how much effort you need as a new joiner in that community in that uh, framework um, to go from zero to a hundred like how fast can you do that um, and how efficient that can be and also how understandable that is i mean most of the times you just run one command and you can see everything running behind the scenes or with some output on the terminal and you get a massive huge load of files and everything and then it's it's really meaningful if you do understand what happens behind the scenes um because the more automation the more of the previous tasks that we mentioned are getting automatically done for you wrapped in a wrapper under a wrapped environment then the least you understand and then if you need something more specifically uh, like more explicitly to do it gets really really hard uh, at least if you understand what happens behind the scene that makes it faster to get the context and, and change do the changes you like um, and also another important thing would be uh, after the, yeah th those were the design partners the par patterns that you need to understand uh, the other important thing would be the integrations with other tools because as I mentioned earlier, each one of those frameworks or tools that you're going to be using need to interact with other parts of your deployment process. That would be either the GitHub actions that we saw earlier, uh, other second uh, third party tools, or even Jira and other like tracking tools that you can uh, that can help you with your uh, processes. Uh, but no matter what you pick i would say if you build it in a very nice way that can be modular and also each part of the project be more independent um, that can help a lot um, so i would say to pick uh, whatever helps the developer build it faster that would be the number one and build the uh, build around some basic principles um, Let's get a little bit deeper, but not too much uh, about the frameworks and tools that we usually see around. So um, in a recent experience, I wanted to start a new project and I didn't want to go through what I already knew, but I wanted to take that as um, in this new role that I have. I, I wanted to get something new um, to learn as well. Um, so I decided to have a quick look and I saw that it's even worse than it was before on the, this kind of um, tools that you have available and also the comparisons and blog posts and everything around which one I should pick 
And it's a matter of presentation. I would say like whatever was presented better, I was about to pick that one. And yes, of course, I picked the one that you can see on the top. Um, but that still doesn't change the way that I was working before that I would like to see a structure of the project that keeps everything independent. Uh, so in the future, you can actually detach, not being highly coupled with one of the frameworks or a specific tool. Um, so if you see all the available out there, frameworks, React, Vue, Angular, Ember, I, I just randomly, really randomly picked a few of them there. I haven't even seen some of them. Um, all of them, they have the good and part, bad parts that are the same, the same pros and cons. Uh, about the community, the learning curve, the full stack support, every one of them is trying to get that. There are a few small differences and some architectural differences that will make the difference for you. Uh, some might be more convenient, some others not. Uh, but the main problem is when you decide to start, if you, if you go with the popularity and all that, it might lead you into um, using a framework or some tools that are massive you might not even need it. So that's why the most important part would be to get something that you understand and then build from there in a way that you can easily change in the future. Uh, here's a graph actually that I, I found really, really interesting that you can get from NPM, npmtrends.com. And it shows you the downloads that are happening when it was updated because you do need to make sure that it's an um, ongoing project once you adopt one of the frameworks and tools that we have available um, and it also, it also gives a mini <coughs> uh, zipped file uh, the size um, it's a it's a really good comparison tool but still it will not be a direct answer for you that this is the one that you should go for because it highly depends on the project that you want to build you want you don't want to get a massive tool for a tiny project um, so yeah, so that's the main thing. How can I know that from whatever side I compare something uh, or what kind of comparison do I do for the project that I want to I want to build, which one should I be? What is the best way to compare all these things um, from, from which aspect? None of them is full on one feature, um, but all of them seem really ideal for what I want to do. Like what is happening? How how I make the perfect comparison? Um, so it's not about which one you would use. So don't worry about that. I would suggest, and that's what the experience so far has shown. It's about how you use what you're going to do. The more you identify that you're be um, doing some uh, changes during the product development, um, how easy will it be for you to make those changes? How easy will it be? If you start alone in the project and then later on you build a proof of concept and then later on you build a team around that, how painful will it be for someone else to join your project? How, how, how easy will it be for them to, to just start being productive right away? Um, what happens with the visual representation? Like, is it heavily like the thing that you're building? Do you really need uh, some eye candies? Like, uh, have, some, have some nice animations and stuff? Um, so, if you can combine all these things with whichever you pick, that you can make it in a way that you can onboard people, you can make it production ready really, really fast, that would be the one to go. And of course, if you want to learn something new, it's good to get a, a tool that seems to support all these quite easily uh, and gives you that kind of um, new experience. But still, you need to make sure the way that you're going to be using that it's not just going to be um, a boilerplate, something up and running, a few tweaks or maybe heavy workarounds. Because don't forget, not only for you specifically, but anyone onboarding in your into um, onto a new uh, framework, they don't know yet the best practices. So that's up to how we can split that couple or like dependency between those projects that will build the main product. Um, we do have a few basic layers, like the backend API, have a nice API, a few calls that you can create and then make things work in a way, nice naming way, and a few bunch of uh, common practices and best, best practices that you can find out there. Then 
of what I usually do, actually what I always do from a few years back, is to build an SDK that will communicate with that API. And that doesn't need to be around any frameworks and like the, the least tools you can use in frame, like no framework, like even for tools, the least you can use to build a library, like an SDK that will have a new API for what the framework, the representation layer will use. Some of the things will be duplicated, but again, it's about reusing what you commonly do, bundling in one place. Um, I will get into more details later on, but it's like another layer before the framework that you will choose. And probably you will need to make a small plugin right there, which will accommodate, like will go along with the framework. To get a little bit more visual of what I'm trying to explain, we have here, um, it's like a puzzle, but a little bit more complex than a puzzle. So the first layer with the services API on the top, um, we need to make sure that the API is flexible enough and supports as many use cases as possible. So usually we try to leave as little as, um, as possible yeah, restri restrictions. Like we should allow most of the things to happen. Um, I will take as an example, one of the projects that I was working on recently was um, a group of um, communication where you have users joining the group and then establishing audio connections within there, sending text events and images. Um, I didn't need to, what, uh, actually what we never did was to restrict a lot what a user can do within the group, joining, leaving. We had only basic commands to restructure those um, uh, with events, to restructure the data sets that we had, uh, stateless. And it's, the API was quite, um, let's say, easy to read, easy to trigger actions, but you could cause inconsistencies really, really easily because you need to know, for example, when you join a conversation, uh, a group, you need to use, um, a member ID, let's say, it's an example, that you might need a payload from another call you just did before. Um, it sounds tough to explain that, and it can cause a lot of headaches. So it's very important to have good documentation at every layer. But still, we wouldn't like to restrict those um, calls, because if you start restricting what you can do, you lose the use cases for later on. So you leave it as wide as open as possible, as flexible. And then you have a client SDK, which is driving that API. So anybody in the future that would like to build another client to talk to your service, they can copy these actions from this SDK. The web, for instance, we did it for web SDK, and then we were driving the teams for iOS and Android. So this is a way to make an a client-side library that you can do more things. You can take care of caching, map data that might be a little bit um, harder. It was harder doing it by yourself from the API with um, uh, simple calls. But this is the case. It's a little bit smarter for those use cases that your product needs. Of course, it will start restricting a little bit the use cases or what you can do with direct calls to your REST API but it's still like another entry point. You might control the REST API by um, REST calls. You might need that. You might want your clients to build uh, their own tool to tweak or do things around. So the client SDK will have a few more use, uh, like a few use cases, a little bit less than before. It will be more um, simple for someone to use. So with two calls, probably you will be able to initiate a flow that in the direct REST API calls would take five calls to get the payloads and then use them somehow. Um, and another common thing would be caching, monitoring, and reporting. Everybody's doing that in every project or in every client that will be needed. So you did that logic and you have an SDK where you can use in many, many cases. And still back to our main goal, which was to build a web client, we use that SDK with the framework that we picked earlier. Um, there are gonna be a few more limitations there to be introduced. 
Uh, so the framework will need a specific way of some data to be presented. You don't want that logic in the SDK. You don't want to make it specific for a framework. So therefore, you build a plugin, a small, tiny little project that will take care of making more friendly your SDK to the framework that you want to pick. So in this case, uh, let's say we pick Angular uh, or React, um, the most popular ones at the moment, I think. Um, you can get um, some kind of inconsistencies between some objects if you, if in JavaScript you are using references or you copy and clone some objects, you can take care of all these things that might cause troubles to your framework within that plugin. Uh, and then you use the framework to do what it's meant to do, to display the data that you will provide. It will have some smart logic about caching some bit more the states, um, holding states for pages that you're using. It will have amazing optimizations. It will have alerts and warnings if you forget area tags or whatever you're not doing well. Um, this way, you rely for what is meant to be um, the front side to make it more optimal and great without worrying what just happened before getting that kind of data structure that you want to present and how it, that will interact with the user. Um, all that interaction with the user, of course, is getting filtered again and it's getting all the way up to the REST API or any API that you have on the server side um, in a way that later on in the future you can either either split teams and have a team working on the framework. You can get experts that they can do best practices in React or Angular or any framework. And they will be good to, to go. Like they will have this um, framework plugin. Again, JavaScript, everything is JavaScript. The teams usually work uh, all the stack. Uh, so they can jump in. You can do code reviews and pull requests between each individual project. And you can get this kind of consistency and expertise in each layer. So if somebody is more expert on getting how the browser is doing some stuff and how something is optimal for the browser, um, they can focus on that client SDK to do a proper uh, memory management and everything that is needed. And that is slightly duplicated under the hood in the framework layer. But the only thing you need to do is to make sure that you keep it updated. Um, and then you wouldn't worry too much about those things. Um, so to get an example of a flow, um, let's say we want to display some users from the API, then you're fetching the data. Uh, but in some cases, you might need to um, do a second call. Let's say um, you fetch a conversation and then you want a group, a group name, and then you want to bring the members of the group or the details of each member. So the SDK layer is the one that knows these things. They know, the SDK knows that you need three calls or how to attach um, a token, access token, and all these things. And then you can also provide that cache here that you can actually intercept the call to the network and you can get some faster results. Then what happens in the next layer would be the data structure. Is everything okay the way that the SDK presented it? Like, is everything working? I mean, is it? convenient for the framework to present it. If it is, uh, or if it's not, <laughs> we want to change that, or we want to create a plugin that will change the structure of the data. If they need change, then we want to do something specific for the framework. We put it in this plugin. Um, if it's not needing any change, so we just fetch uh, the groups and the listing is enough, then we just pass it on to the framework. And then we have this uh, logic in the framework that we have an array and we just display. If we don't need an array and we would prefer to have um, um, a set, we communicate with the team that works in the SDK. Is it something that would refrain or is it something that is not good with the best practices that we're thinking or some other reason that it shouldn't be a set? And they can do it there and then pass it on as what we need for the framework because more likely it will be a decision that can be applied for any kind of front end um, tool or yeah framework. Um, 
or if it's something that it would be too much work to do in the SDK side, then the team can take that into the plugin for this framework. If we see that we, in the future, we want more front side of facing um, project need that change, eventually you don't duplicate that, you just move it on the SDK side. So it's like decisions made. If you think about it in uh, code wise, you create a function to not duplicate your code. It's similar here that you create these kind of layers that you don't duplicate the logic. So you can plug, um, you can get a client or another app from someone else. Then you just expose the SDK API and they can do the work to present in another way the data. And any anytime that you identify that they will need to do the same thing over and over again, you take over that in the SDK layer. So each layer, as I described earlier, it has all these kind of um, structure that shows up here um, that we have like um, less conflict because everything is split into different projects. Um, so we don't get a lot of um, changes within the same file. Uh, it's easier to test because you can test each one of those individually, each one of the um, um, of the layers, and you can build automating tests, you can build deployments, uh, integrations, and everything you need per project. Um, and then you get to reuse that kind of thing for every new client that you want to create a new client application. I think I confused that client term a few times. Um, and of course, it will make it faster and it will make it easier to switch to another framework or another type, like if you want to use Electron later on, and especially for JavaScript, we have so many choices. And then if you want to create um, um, a native uh, project or anything, you just mimic the behavior of the SDK layer to provide that to others. Um, and of course, you can open source that SDK and you get more uh, people working on that and building more. And then the last bit um, is about the agile processes and how you get um, how you get that into teams and how that is helpful. If it's split per project, it's more transparent. It's very easy for everybody to jump in and the planning session from the product in Jira Confluence. You create a feature description, and then within that description, you can start creating technical pages. Uh, that's how we we narrow down the scope of. Uh, the meetings actually it was really really helpful. You can identify there with developers. Um, I think uh, you can identify there with developers how to get. Uh, um, you can get a lot of um, uh, technical details. Identify some risks. Identify some uh, kind of uh, chunk work that can be made a ticket later on. And then of course we move to the Jira board where you can attach as, uh, from the description or the technical specs, you can attach everything um, to create a ticket linked to that and also linked to the um, GitHub repos and all those integrations that are there for very, very smooth PRs. Um, version control was the best part uh, because you can create between those uh, projects, you can create a semantic versioning and that will help you uh, for compatibility, backwards compatibility, everything going back to the API, what version is your SDK, the plugin, and the framework that is using all this kind of uh, structure. And this way you can keep this like neat and very healthy way of uh, um, providing a product. And then it's not going to be a massive change from one side to the other, like a breaking change to the um, a breaking change to the framework can be absorbed in the plugin layer. So we don't affect the way that we communicate to the back end or, and also the other way around. Um, so the main key point of that uh, workflow was to set the acceptance criteria for each project specifically and make the basic test for continuous delivery. Um, so it's up to the team to define in each layer if you're going to provide at least one, um, at least one test or the best case test, so you move on with the PRs. Pretty much, uh, that's what covers all my, um, the way that we were planning things. 
And uh, lastly, the Kanban, which I mentioned earlier, after you set up everything and you have the tickets, uh, the best uh, structure so far that worked for most of the teams was to have the columns to be some of them um, active and some of them inactive. Each ticket, of course, has the best description for everybody to work. Even if you go on holiday, someone else can pick the ticket and they should find the link on what you were intending to do within the confidence pages. Um, and um, the first column would be the backlog, having a few tickets, just those that are needed for the next few weeks. We shouldn't put tickets in there just to have them or just to organize. We have the confluence space for that. Um, so everybody could pick from the backlog, whatever seems more relevant. Depends on the team and the product. If you want to have a specific and strict order, I prefer not to. Uh, and just keep the momentum of each developer when they want to pick something that seems more related than what they thought before. And then later on, um, the next column, the backlog is inactive. Then it's active if you move the ticket in verification, which means that you pick a topic and you investigate what else you need to build that to meet the, the acceptance criteria to say it's done. So you need to have all the information that you can say it's done to work on to make it done. So you gather all the information in that stage. You don't have to immediately start working on that, but you can just then move it ready for development and anybody can move it, and anybody can pick it up. And that means that you gathered everything that is needed and it's accepted. You had the discussions and the conversation with other teams, and then you move it for ready for development. Then another task is from the ready for development to put it in progress, it means that somebody's working on that code pairing, whatever you want to do, and however it works for you and for this ticket specifically. And then you move it to code review. Ideally, you want each ticket to last for a day, which means that even the code review could happen within the day. If not, you have to chase it up. It's your ticket and your responsibility mainly, and you have the stand-ups and the casual meetings uh, to chase for that. And within the code review, of course, it's up to the team to define the acceptance and the comments. When you create a comment and you want actually the ticket to be merged, but you just don't want to miss something, then you just create another ticket and link it to that. Or if it's something that's going to break or you worry that it's going to break something, then you do a suggestion and not accept. So it shouldn't be merged. Of course, um, if there's a QA, it's involved in that stage, either before the merge or after, depends on the workflow that you have set up. And after that, you push the ticket to ready for release. Everything is passing and is ready for, to make a release. Some, some projects are easy to automate that part as well, when it's ready for release to actually do the release automatically. Some other needs a holding area where you hold and pile up the tickets for that specific version. And the Jira version is actually a really, really um, good thing because if you keep a nice title on the ticket, then it gives you directly a change log. So imagine if you have four projects just for the front, that sometimes in, in all the projects that I saw or before joining teams, it was one project for all this front side. It was very hard to say what changed and how it changed and how this is being used. So you can get that from Jira and the version number all neat per layer of each project that you build. Um, that's pretty much it. And thank you. And um, yeah, we'll look for the questions and everything you need. Uh, you can find me uh, with this handler everywhere, anywhere. Yeah, that's it. Thanks, Kostas. Um, there, there, there is a question um, from, from Deborah Taranska. Uh, Deborah has a question that um, she'll find really useful for the work she's doing on her code base. Um, so uh, the, the question is how to build an SDK and what are the best practices whilst doing so? Um, yeah, um, actually, that's a really good question. I didn't go too deep into that. Um, I had it in my mind as a, an end video. Um, so yeah, um, SDK is actually um, imagine it as the way that you want your service to be approached, like what use, case, what use cases you want to create. Um, the SDK layer is just pure JavaScript. Um, some examples I can give you is, um, let's say, the WebSocket communication. Um, you will pick a tool to connect to your backend. 
Uh, so probably socket IO, let's say. So you try to pick as little as possible of those libraries or tools, uh, but definitely not a, a big framework, nothing that touches your screen. The SDK ideally is only JavaScript running some functions and logic. Uh, the functions that are running would be contacting your API, getting the token, the access token. Um, like I can give you examples of the interface would be um, like login, uh, get um, get users, create create groups, join groups, um, and then you build it in a way that makes sense. Like you have a group, you you create the file structure as well, um, the models. So once you do get groups, you create a group class, and then in that group class you have dot users or dot members, and then you can say class um, group dot uh, member members first and then kick so you remove um, a member from the group all this kind of logic that how you manage the groups or member fifth member or whatever dot enable audio that will kick in the audio api for the browser both things the models and the library specifically for the browser like how to create um, audio streams how to um, connect to a web socket all those things are going to be happening everywhere. Um, so you can, yes, I, I see also another question for the GraphQL. Yes, also GraphQL can take, uh, make it even simpler instead of having to do three calls to get and shape the, that class. You can use GraphQL to make it simpler and have one, but still you need that kind of logic like how you initiate um, the WebSocket, what you need to link from that WebSocket, Still, you can use GraphQL to minimize the things that you want to display. But again, if you do too much with GraphQL, you will go so so narrow that that um, you will make a client that is specific, like you limit the use cases. So again, with GraphQL, you will keep it quite wide, and maybe you will need to store something in cache, intercept the cache. But again, use some tools like how to enable audio, how to um, cross-browser compatibility, take care of these things. So everything that will be happening for every framework that you can imagine uh, a developer client will use, you put it in that SDK. And then the second bit of the question is how you get that out. That's an NPM module, and you can find best practices and also how to, best practices, it's also how you make modules within your SDK. Um, so you can read upon that really, really um, to pick your own group of best practices but make sure you put that in confluence and, and try to communicate that in code reviews um, and then you create that npm module that can be accessed by different ways uh, one of the great challenges is how you bundle that to provide an entry point for node so i could use my sdk for the browser on node server and i could trigger calls that's the ideal because it means that it's not touching the browser so it's not mixing at any level with the framework or the display layer. So you have an SDK, you can run even on the back end and say, login, create group, add users and everything else. And then after that, you bundle it, uh, yeah, for the way you bundle it, you can also have, uh, just to finish with the answer, uh, switches. So you can bundle some light version or some version with audio features. So you can exclude and include those tools or you can export a version just for frameworks uh, for the browser if they need to attach something on the browser. Like sometimes you need to attach the audio. So you can put flags there and make sure that if you don't need audio, it will never try to do that. And stuff like that. I hope that asks that question. Um, and then I see another one, I will pick it up then. Uh, it says, um, how about microservices would be better than with REST? It's not, it's not a decision to make between REST services or the GraphQL. I do believe GraphQL is really good um, and really efficient for that. It depends on the project and the layer of um, the API that my, the use cases, how many use cases you want to support and how diverse those are. Um, so if you have the GraphQL there, it's good because you can create a, another layer of that interface, a little bit more specific for some use cases. If you if you decide to go with REST, it means that you don't have too many consequent uh, consequent uh, calls. So, for instance, in this example that I was doing before with GraphQL, 
it would be easier for you to get a group, the members of the group, which ones are active. Um, depends on the structure that you have at the back end. I already had three calls that could be one in GraphQL. I didn't worry too much and it wasn't high priority to move from microservices with REST to a GraphQL service because it was very cheap to do those three calls at the time. But if you see that that's expanding, it should definitely be something that you can eventually support. But also bear in mind that if you do these three calls, it's only like how often those are going to be happening. Because if, if you have a WebSocket connection, you can manage to listen to new events and update your local one data set. So you don't have to fetch every time when something is happening. So if you manage well your client, you can cache these things and you can just fetch only the updates. So it might not be that critical to move something like GraphQL if you don't really um, have all these consequences. Calls. I hope this answered all the questions. Um, let me know. I think there's a there's another question. <laughs> <laughs> how about engines? I am not sure. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Make yeah. as many questions as you want. Um, what about engines? I don't get the context for that. It's not um, it's not a problem how you scale that. Actually, the opposite. It helps. Um, yeah, if you can continue the question or we can catch up uh, after uh, to tell me what you mean about endings and how, how, to, like, how you have it in your head, what, what is the question? Okay, okay, we can catch up. Cool, cool. Thank, thanks, Costas. Really appreciate it. Great, great talk again. Um, yeah, no, thanks everyone who, who has attended tonight. Obviously, the three speakers, firstly. Um, Really appreciate your time, all three of you. Uh, three brilliant talks, and that will be up on our YouTube channel, the JS Roundabout YouTube channel soon. Um, Ovo and Darcy in particular for helping to put tonight on and providing great speakers. Um, guys, like I said, if you do put anything online, please hashtag us, JS Roundabout. Um, I'm going to put the uh we, we run seven meetups um so i'm just putting the link to our website in the chat uh you can keep up to date there um if if you want to because you know if you're interested in other uh technology technology such as java we've got an agile one devops ux and and more um so I'd hope to see some of you at those as well. We're looking to get more meetups moving, even through this period where we obviously have to do them uh, on video. Um, I, as most of you know by now, my name is Ben Sullivans. Um, please connect with me. I, I recruit for software engineering positions. Um, whether you're looking now, it doesn't matter. Um, we can. It'd still be good to connect for the future. Obviously. On the flip side, if you're hiring engineers as well, please connect. And um, yeah, I, I, I look forward to, uh, to seeing you all at future meetups. Thanks very much. It was, uh, it was, it was a lot of fun uh, tonight.